I'm going to make a brief introduction for, for our next speaker. Well, we have uh, Ramiro Caro uh, now. Ramiro Caro is a senior data scientist for Mercado Libre, the biggest e-commerce site in Latin America, and has plenty of experience working with data in different industries, such as oil, consulting, and energy. Now we are going to have the session called, What do you do when you can trust your labels? This is, an, a, this is a practical uh, approach. So let's welcome Ramiro Caro. You can go ahead, Ramiro. Hello, the, um, this is uh, what to do when you can trust your labels. Um, in this uh, talk, we want to try to tell you about our experience uh, working with uh, label data and how we can build label data sets using different sources of information and different learning methods, right? Um, well, um, the, I was already presented, so my name is Ramir. I'm not going to spend too much time here. Like I say, I'm the data science at Mercado Libre. To give you some context, Mercado Libre is an um, e commerce site uh, because in Latin America, we currently have uh, almost 65 million buyers and more than 12 million sellers each each month so as you can see on all this uh, movement of people and product we have many products that we don't want to make it uh, to the marketplace so in our team we basically uh, work in detecting and moderating any product that by country legislation or by internal policy cannot be published on the site um, this is a highly unbalanced classification. We have more than 80, 48 policies that we must identify. We receive more than 4 million requests every day. And we also have like an adversarial component in our system that we have players um, that will try to fool our system com continually. So we need to be like a very, uh, proficient identifying these new patterns of behavior and and introduce them to the model. Um, for example, in this case, this uh, title is in Portuguese, but you can say the they introduce um, the name of an abortive drug here, uh, mask as a tire publication. So in this case, we need have the information on the title. But in other cases, like the one I show you here, the title have no information about uh, the drug. We only can identify this if we if we check the pictures, and even more, if we keep going on time, there are some publications like this that is supposed to be a fabric. The title doesn't give you give us any information. Uh, the pictures neither. So we need to check like the product variations, in this case, the design to identify that the seller is trying to sell an aborted drug. Uh, so we want to talk about labels. So a, a good question is uh, where labels come from? Um, when I mention this is because sometimes we assume the, the machine learning problem is defined within the data itself. Like all we need to solve this problem is already there. And this is rarely the case. Um, normally when we start a machine learning problem, this is not defined by the data. We usually get an unstructured definition like a document or some set of rules or some technical specification. And we must take this information and start building our labels based on that. So one idea that I want to leave here is labels needs to be constructed. They are not just there for, for taking, we need to build them. So to build them, we need information and we need methods. So how we use and integrate this information available to generate the labels is a fundamental step in the design and planning of any machine learning system. If we have a perfect model but our labels are not properly done, the impact that this model will have in the real world is not going to be the one that we desire. 
So in our case, for the moderation of products, we have like information for the positive class, which is the, the prohibited one. Uh, we have the documentation, the rules of procedures of the site. We need some reports and denounces from users that use the platform. And we need some heuristic and business rules that were previously implemented, uh, like mainly based on rejects or seller behavior. Some of them were uh, manually revised and others were not. Um, in the other side, for the negative class, uh, it's all the active publication on the site, right? And another special case is the robot moderations, which are cases um, that were initially wrongly moderated, and then the seller contact us and request to be uh, put back on the marketplace. So in these cases, we have a friction with the seller, and this is one of the cases we're trying to avoid. So within information, how we can build the labels? Well, uh, we can use many methods. Now we're going to talk uh, about manual labeling, uh, active learning, weak learning, and semi-supervised. Uh, these three last, there is a lot of theory um, um, for this. We are not trying to go into that. The idea here is to have an idea, a motivation for them, so we can know when to use each and how, which is the one that fits better to our, our problem. So uh, at the beginning of, of uh, this uh, design, um, we put as an objective to moderate as much as we can, but minimize the amount of, uh, hello? Um, but minimize the amount of uh, friction with the sellers. So to measure it, we have a, uh, a rollback rate, which is the amount of claims uh, versus the amount of moderation that we do the ratio. And also we have a manual precision, which is uh, derived from a, from a humanly reviewed sample. So these are the considerations that we take at the beginning. So the first step that we uh, in the first step of the offer process, we decide to only use um, manual review information. So uh, why do we choose to use only um, manual? First, because we have the greatest precision. And secondly, because we can make a factibility check. So usually the first step with the machine learning problem could be not using machine learning at all. So we need to see if a person can, in, <clears throat> can differentiate the problem. In this case, it was very obvious, but it's, this is not always the case. Uh, but we need that we can, and that like, different per people will come up to the same result. Uh, on the con side, of course, this is very resource intensive, both in time and people. Right, so it doesn't scale well to, to a lot of data. So we set up um, a moderation system. We work like this. Um, like you can see, um, or we are, cannot check all of, um, all of uh, our, our moderations. So some of them are going to act automatically and some of them are going to be sent to a human agent for review. So the first decision that we must take is uh, which one we send for, moderate, for, for review and which one we're going to directly act. So uh, in this case, we use a, a criteria, a method known as uh, active learning. In this case, we still use um, manual labeling, but we try to prioritize the items that provide the greatest amount of information to the problem. So how we do that? If, well, uh, we start with a random sample, then we label that and train and evaluate one or many models. And um, from those models, we generate a priority score. So 
How do we generate the score? Well, there is many methods. Um, most of them are based on our certainty. Uh, in, in our case, uh, we use uh, we use the um, the difference score of the different classes to calculate the entropy. So this will give you an indication of how close are to the decision boundary, and we choose to prioritize those. But we could easily take, for example, many models and select those which the greatest amount of disagreement within the, the models. Or we can choose to combine them and, and use some kind of exploration, exploitation criteria. So after we have this score, basically we sample again, but now we take the, the most valuable cases, which are going to be the ones with the highest priority. And these samples, if we if we if we choose them wisely, we will have much more information, uh, and we'll have to define the the classification boundaries um, much more efficiently than if we just uh, randomly sample. So what we did is we add this uh, this active learning sample in in the model workflow, and we start choosing. Uh, the, the cases with the most value for human review and the rest, we, we just moderating them automatically. Um, what are the, the pros of this method? Well, um, the, we have a greater amount of information at each review. And it's an iterative process that allow us to adjust the error or certainty. And in the con side, well, we still depend on human revision. And sometimes uh, we could overfit over one decision boundary. We start converging to one decision boundary. And sometimes there are some air, other areas in the, in the space of um, labels that we don't check. Um, how we did with, with, this, uh, with, this, um, with this model? Well, uh, the precision was OK. It met expectation, but the recall and, and the moderation shared, uh, it was not. So we also have a rapid degradation of this model. And we were, like, were missing some obvious cases. Like we said, we were only training with the manually review cases. So these were the, the least confident ones. So in some cases that were very obvious, um, we, didn't, we didn't get them. So the diagnosis was, was very clear, clear. We need to get more label cases. So we start looking for them. So what, where do we get more labels? Well, the, the most obvious answer was to incorporate all the automatic detections that we were doing. However, doing this requires like a label validation process. So we need to see if that decision that we took, uh, we need to add another confidence label, so layer, so we can decide if we can incorporate this to, to our training process. So how, how we validate this, these labels? Well, in our case, we have a framework of hypothesis testing and experimentation that we can use to generate like weak label function from each experiment. These experiments are like, uh, very focused cases, like we, comp we experiment um, if uh, which is the average stock of a certain prohibited case. So this not doesn't this uh, don't need to be like uh, super precise, but we need to complement. They need to provide complementary information about the, the input data, right? So with all these uh, different experiments, we can generate a confidence score um, related with the result and the statistical significance of the result in, in that experiment. So the thing that I was talking basically is the basis of what we call weak supervision learning, which is incorporating knowledge to the system using labeling functions we provide like weak labels that can be combined into strong predictive models. So we use uh, different indicators. Some are more reliable, some are less, but 
the combination of all of them can give us a, a, a label candidate and a confidence score. So in this case, all the automatic information we, we can have, we can put them through a set of uh, labeling functions and decide if they are reliable enough to include in the training process. So what we did basically is to put this in, in the system too. And what it allows to is that give us an, an entry point. So each time we have a new insight about uh, any information, we can incorporate it very easily in each retraining to the, to the system. Um, so uh, the pros for, for this approach, for this um, step, is we have an automatic, we have higher volume, it's faster and it's cheaper because uh, we, we don't require to have someone constantly checking this, uh, this process. Uh, we have a confidence score for, for each case that can be used to parameterize the system or to set a threshold for different levels of, of reliability. Uh, and also allows to incorporate new domain knowledge to the, to the system very easily. So in the other hand, labels still have a lower confidence than manually review cases. Um, and also labeling functions can be a way to introduce biases to the system. We have to be very careful how we define them and what information we use, because uh, we can end up introducing uh, dangerous bias to our data. So uh, we apply all these um, techniques uh, and we managed to increase the amount of prohibited product cases in the data set in a tenfold. Uh, also, all the hypotheses and experiments we, we made help us to um, valuable, give us very, very valuable information for the feature selection. And with all this information, we generate a new model and we train with a much uh, more complete and uh, data set and much more wider range of cases. Um, so, well, now um, this were the, the result of the, this retraining and redesign of the, of the cases. The moderation share, we call this metric, is uh, how many of the moderations done all across the site were done by your system. SCD is the name, internal name of the, of the model. So we started in 2020 with uh, just two and a half percent with only manually revised data. And then we implemented the active learning criteria. We, went to eight and then after implementing all the weak learners and uh, the data automatic data validation uh, our model start to gain in a lot of uh, tr traction so we multiply by six the amount of uh, moderation we made and so we end up uh, uh, participating with the 45 percent of all moderations done in the site and um, all in this time, we managed to keep our rollback rate very controlled between two and 3%. So um, down, having done all this stuff, um, we can say that we can already trace all labels, right? Well, not, uh, not, uh, not yet. So in this, so far, we've been talking about generating new labels, but we can also use all these methods for, for validating them to quality check if for labels uh, uh, we can trust. So for example, in 2020, um, this uh, Mercado Libre allow um, a cross boarding trading service, which is basically sellers can from different countries can can send uh, products to another one. So mainly we have a great inflow of sellers, mainly from, from China and, and countries in, in, in Asia with uh, great production 
rates and, and availability. So all these new sellers have new behaviors we need to capture. And for example, we noticed that one uh, policy that didn't use to be very important start uh, became a very dominant moderation policy. So we adapt, we retrain, we use this data to, to adjust our model. But we find out that even if we were constantly moderating this category, there was almost no rollback requested by any seller. And the, the volume of moderation in one point, it was like 75% only this category, which was a little bit strange. So we need to analyze it uh, a little bit uh, deeply. So when we check them, we, <clears throat> we found out that most sellers were using uh, automated script to publish the product and they never contact customer service. So we can moderate or we can uh, cancel all their publications. They will start uh, still didn't complain about anything. So when we review and we calculate the real precision on that policy, we found out that it was around 17%. So um, very, very low. So in this case, luckily we have, a, we could uh, introduce a new set of rules. In this case, like we say before the, the weak learning, instead of using to generate new labels, we start using them to uh, validate uh, all, all moderation. So um, a lot of things that were moderated, they shouldn't have been. So we define a new set of rules just to uh, exclude those cases from, from the training process because we were perpetrating these errors. So in these cases, we, we show uh, how quickly we can introduce new information to the system in a quite robust way, uh, just defining a new set of rules for a different group of product, in this case, the, the cross-border uh, cross trading product. Um, also, this when this happened, we start um, suspecting that the same uh, the same phenomenon could be happening in, in with the other policies too. So, Ramiro, were... uh, sorry to interrupt you, just a kind reminding. We still have five minutes more. Actually, until now, there are no uh, questions from our participants. So, you can go ahead with your, you can continue with your presentation. Okay, thank you. Um, so, we try to fine also we decided we, we need to go after undetected false positives so we can we can minimize this uh, under under reporting of, of false of wrongly moderated cases so what we did is we use the rollback that we have and we try to pivot around them and frame this as a semi-supervised learning problem to to find cases that were similar to rollbacks, but they were not uh, reported. So, semi <clears throat> so like I said, we frame it as a semi-supervised learning, which is a method that allows us to combine uh, a small amount of labeled data with a large amount of unlabeled data that will help us to, to discover or to understand the underlying distribution. So in these cases, um, we we need to have uh, we need to have data that is uh, that complies with certain assumptions like continuity assumptions cluster or manifold. Uh, these are related to that similar representations of the product. We have a higher probability of having this the same label. So we we use this. Um, in, when we try in using in all the universe of publications available in the site, um, we, we didn't have good results, but then we reduced the sample space to only automatic moderations. Um, we changed the representations of, of the products to a simpler 
representation. And also we try using diff different similarity measurements. So introducing all these uh, modifications, uh, we managed to, to find a very good solution and to find this unreported uh, false positive and, and incorporated this to, to the workflow. So we maximize the, the impact of, of, each, uh, of each rollback. Um, and we introduce this to the, to the flow so it won't come work online. So now we have a weak learning validation and then we have a semi-supervised uh, detector of, of potentially, of, 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 or, yeah, of potentially rollbacks in the future. So applying all this method, we went again and check the, the quality of the measurement and find out after implementing all these techniques and all this uh, validation process, we, this policy that was so dominant and we have very, very bad uh, precision, we move it from 15 to 40 uh, from, to 83% of precision. Uh, the overall precision of the system went from 43 to 72, and we only decreased the amount of moderations that we perform on a 10%, uh, which was a very, very small price to pay for, for that bump in, in, in precision, right? So, well, this is uh, all I wanted to tell you. I hope this could be useful or interesting for you. And if you have any question, I'll be available on Slack. Thank you very much.